Well, hey, howdy, hi, welcome, welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for stopping by to join me today. I really do appreciate it. My name is Ellie, and I'm a witch. And this over here is my teaching assistant, Andy. And today is tea time and true crime. And today's case is the disappearance of Cheryl Grimmer. This one is about the disappearance of a little girl. So if you're not interested in hearing about that, I completely understand. I do have a couple of other series on my channel. I talk about cryptids on Sundays and I talk about history on Mondays. And I did just do a series called Kill Miss, and it was originally supposed to be 12 days, but technical difficulties. But there are still a couple of episodes that were really fun. Um, several that were child-related, though, so maybe avoid the, uh, the true crime episodes. But I did talk about the creatures of Christmas, I talked about the history of Christmas yesterday. I read Twas the Night Before Christmas, so if any of that interests you, definitely go ahead and check it out. And, uh, yeah, I don't really have anything else today. It's, uh... It's a little bit of a strange case. It is a cold case, so if you're not interested in unsolved cases, definitely find another video. I do have several solved cases on my channel, however, and uh, let's just jump in and talking about Cheryl Grimmer. So, Cheryl Grimmer was born in 1966 in Bristol, England, and her parents were Carol and Vince Grimmer, and she had three brothers, Ricky, Stephen, and Paul. Although they were originally from England, the family moved to Australia when Cheryl was about two years old, and they moved into Fairy Meadow Migrant Hostel in Australia. Now, the kids were very excited because it was right by the beach. It was this beach that the family was at, January 12th of 1970. Now, Vince was not with the family for this outing as he was working, but the children were satisfied to go alone with their mother. Now, they did stay for several hours, but around 1.30 that afternoon, the weather began to worsen, so Carol tells the kids to pack up and start heading back to the hostel. Now, all the kids complied with the request and ran off to get showered in the beach stalls, However, about 10 minutes after the kids went to shower, Ricky had come back to tell his mother that Cheryl refused to come out of the shower. So, Carol went with him to see what was wrong, only to discover her daughter was missing. Now, Carol immediately ran to a nearby home and asked the residents to phone the police. A man had come forward during the initial investigation to say that he had seen somebody holding Cheryl up to get a drink from the water fountain. However, Ricky stated it was him who had done that, and believed the witness was just conflating the disappearance with that instance. Another claim was that Cheryl had been seen in a white car shortly after the disappearance. However, the second claim has never been verified. The search effort was extensive, and almost immediately, police came up with four theories as to what had happened. So, theory one was that she was hiding and ended up falling asleep, therefore becoming lost. Theory two, she had got back into the water and the current carried her away. Theory three, that she accidentally fell into a waterway. Theory four, she was kidnapped. After a day of searching, all but the kidnapping theory was thrown out. Police at this point began to investigate leads. One of the prominent leads was about a blue Volkswagen Type 2 van that was sighted near the scene at the time of Cheryl's disappearance. Three days into the search, police received a ransom note. Now, this note stated that Cheryl was safe and unharmed, but they wanted $10,000 in exchange for her return. Now, police were told to drop the money at a point in Bully. However, the kidnapper never showed up for the exchange, and unfortunately, this was deemed a hoax, and the leads stopped coming in. The notoriety of the case actually caused the Grimmer family to move back to England, where they stayed for the next 10 years. Police were not going to give up, though. They had three suspects, but unfortunately none of them panned out. But then, about a year and a half after Cheryl's disappearance, a 17-year-old came forward and said he had kidnapped and killed Cheryl. He gave details about an area near the intersection of Brokers and Begloni, and he mentioned a tubular steel gate, cattle guards, train tracks, and a small creek. He took police to the area and claimed he buried Cheryl in that general area. However, with the new construction in that area since the time, he wasn't entirely sure about where the body was at that point. Police obviously investigated further, and they interviewed a resident who stated that at the time of Cheryl's kidnapping, there was no cattle guard, and there had never been a tubular gate in that area. So this statement, along with the 17-year-old not being able to fully identify a gravesite, Police ended up concluding the confession to be false. Unfortunately, after this, the case did go cold. There was renewed interest in the case in the early 2000s, however. 
Police Minister Micah Gallacher expressed his hope that Cheryl was alive and out there somewhere. Now, this was amidst statements that people believe Cheryl and or her kidnapper to be dead. Mike encouraged anyone who thought they might be Cheryl to come forward to be tested. A distinguishing characteristic they published was that Cheryl's belly button stuck out about one centimeter due to a medical condition. Now, this information actually brought forward a young lady who thought she might be Cheryl. However, a DNA test did rule her out. It was in 2011 that Cheryl was officially declared dead. The coroner stating in the report that Cheryl likely died shortly after the abduction and encouraged police to reopen the case. Carol Grimmer did not believe this, however. She held to the belief that her daughter is alive. Going off of this, police did reopen the case and even offered a $100,000 reward for any information on her disappearance or location. In response to reopening the case, the police created a new task force called Strike Force Wessel. Now, unfortunately, shortly after the case was reopened, both Carol and Vince died, never having known what happened to their only daughter. In 2016, all of the evidence, witness statement, reports had been cataloged into their computer system. Now, this made it easier for police to reinvestigate everything, and with this, they also wanted to re-interview witnesses, and because they were, had all this information so readily available, it was a lot easier to find new leads. One of these leads they wanted to reinvestigate was the confession of the 17-year-old boy. Now, the police returned to speak with the homeowner they spoke with the first time. This time, however, they spoke with the owner's son, who said his father had actually been mistaken. The son said that the cattle guard was there at the time of the disappearance, along with the tubular gate. After the police did more investigating, they were able to find three witnesses who all came forward to say they saw a younger man hanging out outside of the beach showers on the day of Cheryl's disappearance. They also all said that this young man was seen carrying a fair-haired child shortly after. Now, due to those eyewitness statements, police asked that the original confessor come forward to speak with police again. This man would have been about in his 60s by this point, but no one came forward. Police weren't going to let this go, however, and started to investigate Mont Penning Training School for Boys, where they believe the suspect had attended in the 70s, and they had reportedly got this tip from a former resident or staff member at the school who had been there at the same time as the suspect. March 23rd, 2017, police finally found this man. He was arrested and charged with the kidnapping and murder of Cheryl. Now, unfortunately, police believe that they will never find Cheryl's body due to the development of the area that it was supposedly left in. Now, this man's name has never been released to the public as he was only a minor, 15, at the time he allegedly committed the crimes. Now, the man had actually given statements to his doctors prior to confessing. His statement started with his desire to end his own life, as well as those around him, but then became about Cheryl. He said that after he abducted her, he gagged her with a handkerchief and tied her hands behind her back with a shoelace before leaving her in a drain for about 35 minutes. After he came back for her, he took her about 3 kilometers to Baglone, where he intended to sexually assault her. Now, notably, the man denied the claim that he had intended to do anything sexual to the little girl, but back to the statement, he said that he took the gag out of her mouth and she started to scream. So to stop her from screaming, he put his hands around her neck and told her to shut up before he eventually strangled her to death. He then laid on the ground, covered her with bushes and dirt, then headed back to the beach. The police said that he knew facts that were released to the public, including the color of Cheryl's swimsuit, the color of the towel she had been using, and the detail that Ricky had lifted her up to drink from the water fountain shortly before the abduction. For the record, blue and white for the bathing suit and towel. For the defense's part, they argue that the man was mentally unwell at the time of the crime, making his confession inadmissible. Their other point was that this man had confessed to the murder of a prison guard that was later confirmed to be false. The man still appeared before the court via Zoom in September of 2018. He gave only his name and entered a plea of not guilty. Now, his child was to go forward in the following year, however, the case was dropped due to the judge ruling his original confession inadmissible. The police had questioned a minor without his parents or guardians present. And while it hadn't been a requirement at the time of the confession, the judge still applied it to that situation. November of 2023 had one more lead that the family hopes to bring some answers they have been looking for for so long. A man came forward about a sighting on the day of Cheryl's abduction. He said he was passing the showers when he heard a child yelling and, quote, 
When I glanced back at the toilet block, the profile of the guy was sort of full stride with this baby in his arms, just kind of screaming and yelling at his hip, like low on his hip, end quote. The Bayman police believed this man to be credible, and he also remembered a storm that happened that day on the beach, which was the same one that the Grimmers were leaving the beach because of. Now, this man stated the person that he saw abduct Cheryl was a teenager, and others have said they also saw a teenager around that area. Most estimates were that he's about 17 to 18 at the time. Now, no new arrests have been made at this time, but police are still asking for any information to be brought forward. So that's all I have for you today. It is another really sad one since it is an unsolved disappearance of a little girl. However, I'm going to try to do more pep... I can't say peppier if I'm talking about true crime. I'm going to stop doing less child murder cases because it's just sad and it's a weird niche that I've fallen into at this point and I'm not particularly a fan. So we're going to try to stop that. But um, it... It was just a really sad one to kind of like research and look into and the family still is hopeful and it sucks that the that the man that confessed his whole trial was thrown out just because the judge retroactively applied a law that didn't that wasn't applied then so you can't really punish police though you could have because this kid literally admitted to murder and they did nothing but I just think that that's it's a little bit dumb to do that because he admitted to it regardless of his age at the time the laws were different so police did the proper thing at the time so just dumb but is what it is i guess hopefully we will find some more leads in next year or a few years down the line and we can bring a little bit of closure to that family but with all that being said uh if you liked the video hit that thumbs up button and uh suggest cases that don't involve child murder in the in the description box of nope in the comments and if you didn't like the video hit that dislike button and tell me what you think i could improve i do appreciate some constructive criticism and with all that being said i hope you guys have a great rest of your day and i will see you on sunday bye